You guys excited? Yeah! Who's excited for Scott Pilgrim Takes Off? <laughs> November 17th on Netflix. Yeah! Uh, please give a big round of applause for Mr. Brian Lee O'Malley. <laughs> Um, I'm moderating a panel for the first time in my life. Hi. How are you doing? Is it, is it okay? Are you guys warm enough? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Um, all right. I'm Brian Lee O'Malley, as he said. Um, I uh, I'm the cartoonist. I made Scott Pilgrim the, the first time. The first time. Um, almost 20 years ago, uh, I was drawing a little black and white comic book and. Um, Never thought it would take me really anywhere, but here I am in front of all you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, it kind of took me around the world, uh, which is crazy. I didn't live in LA before I made Scott Pilgrim. Now I do. Um, and then it also let me work with so many amazing people. So I'm going to start bringing some of them out here. You might know who they are. Uh, what do we have here? You saw their names on the poster. The first one, you probably know him. You love him. You probably love him. Director, auteur, raconteur, Edgar Wright. Oh, that's a good reaction. Can you guys turn it on? <laughs> <laughs> what are you? What do you expect him to do? Is he gonna throw something in the audience? Um, okay, let's do someone else here. Uh, noted writer, director, showrunner, co-creator of Scott Pilgrim Takes Off, Ben David Grabinski. <laughs> it's a good crowd. You guys are riled up. Did this work? You were like chanting Edgar's name, but not mine, and I get it. Ben, but, it's uh, not me. Ben, 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 it's ben, actually Ben David, so you're failing so bad. It's, ben, it's ben, ben David, Ben David. Ben, it's one ben, word. Ben David. Stop it. Two, wrong, wrong number of syllables. All right, next. Uh, he's a composer. He worked on a few things you may have heard of. Uh, let's see here. The Raid 1 and 2, o Oblivion, The Witcher, Are You Afraid of the Dark, and Happily, it's Joseph Trapanese. Joseph, 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 Joseph. All right, and we got room for, looks like four more. The right number of syllables for a chant. <laughs> That's right. I'm gonna get mad at my parents about that one. <laughs> All right, these are um, four guys you might know. Uh, Boys from Brooklyn, they taught the Game Boy how to play guitar. It's Anna Monaguchi. Yeah. That's, that's Pete, Luke, Ari, and James. Hey guys. Right, that's it. Anna Monaguchi is too many syllables to chant. I know. Uh, no, it's not, yeah. I think it's almost enough. Anna, Anna. <laughs> Pick one, yeah. How are we all doing tonight? No, 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 I'm asking them now. Oh, wait, us or them? Well, I already asked them. Oh. Before you got here. <laughs> I think what did they say? The crowd's already had a lot to say. I they've, think already, they've already spoken, yeah. I think uh, we're Edgar, doing how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. I'm, I'm very happy to be uh, in revenge of dot, dot, dot. 
and scenic Eagle Rock. I love Eagle Rock. It's cool. Um, all right, should I get started? What are we going to do? What are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about That's music okay, because we have a bunch of uh, musicians here today. Um, Scott Pilgrim, music. They're related somehow, aren't they? Co strangely, comics don't have music in them. Uh, they're a silent medium. Um, and yet, here we are with a bunch of musicians. How did we get here? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Brian, I think, Brian, I think you're the new space ghost. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I mean, when I, was, when I was growing up, starting my career and stuff, I always loved movies with great needle drops. And uh, when I first saw Shaun of the Dead in space, uh, I immediately responded to Edgar's use of music. So I was wondering, to kick us off here, what, Edgar, what is your philosophy when it comes to that stuff, scoring and needle drops? Do you, is that too big of a question? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think uh, that is, I mean, it's interesting. Well, I, I don't know what to, uh, I guess there's films that, like, in growing up that really, like, blew my mind with their sort of use of music, like, um, I'd say particularly when I was young, American Wealth in London was a film yeah. where the soundtrack like just really blew my head off of like, oh, you can do that? Like right. in, a, in a horror film and it has just pop songs all the way through. So probably that was the inspiration for that. And in, in Spaced, uh, Spaced was that we were trying to find the music that sounded like the characters. Right. And then I guess in Shaun of the Dead, the, the it's counter scoring, it's like, what would be the weirdest song to hear right now in the middle of a zombie apocalypse? Right, the, the pop pop against violence kind of thing. Yes. You know? I always so, love that. Yeah, it was... And, and I think when we first started talking about the film, one of the first things is that you had <clears throat> done a playlist back in the days of CDRs, <laughs> burning, mm -hmm. burning discs, remember that, is that you had done a playlist for every book, and then that kind of set me off sending, like, the... A playlist back to you, like the response, right? They yeah. felt like we were sending love letters to yeah, each so other. Yeah, we were we were trading mixtapes. It was very romantic uh, in, in the mid two thousands. Um, what, what about um? So it's no, it's not just you talking, Edgar. We got two other. Um, we got another director here. We got a composer here. What do you guys think about like generally scoring and needle drops? Because we use a lot in this show, but we can't really get into details on the show yet. Well, I'd really like to talk about the needle drops in Shaun of the Dead. Oh uh, yeah. Especially the montages we're using music from uh, in Dawn of the Dead and Shaun of the Dead. Oh, Would you like yeah. to talk about that? I'm sure you don't want to talk about that. <laughs> La Caccia. It's, it's almost 20 years old. I it mean, is. it's fun to be getting, have to get in touch with Zom uh, Goblin's lawyer. So that's funny. No, I mean, it was, I mean that, was, that was just fun. Like, sort of, the thing, I mean, I can get super nerdy on this, but we didn't, I, mean, I don't want to bore everybody. <laughs> I can talk about my worst experience with the needle drop which is that uh, I'd spent 18 months trying to get a song from Modern Lovers and I had to like write personal letters to people who didn't have email addresses and at the last minute it fell apart and I had to get a new song within a week and I wanted to make sure it was something that hadn't been in a movie before and I got a Nick Cave song and I was so excited and I locked the cut and then I showed it to my girlfriend and she said, wow, you got the song from Shrek 2. <laughs> And I did not know the song was in Shrek 2 because I hadn't seen it. No disrespect to Shrek 2. So now every time I watch my own movie, I'm like, oh, I got th that's the Shrek, oh, it's Shrek 2 song. <laughs> it's a great song. I, a, a, a similar story is uh, in Shaun of the Dead when they're throwing the records at the zombies. Quite late in the day, we had to find out that if we wanted to see the cover, we had to clear it with the band. Now, of course, some of those albums are getting trashed. And so Simon Pegg, I remember, had to write a letter to Mark Knopfler from Dire Straits to convince him that A, he really loved the album, and B, was it still okay to smash it over a zombie's head? <laughs> it was unsuccessful. Oh but on the flip side, and I always give credit to this, Sade was all in. <laughs> so Sade is officially the coolest. Yeah. That's she, our queen. She's in Scott Pilgrim in a form too, right? She, we have a cover of Sade in Scott Pilgrim. Yes. Hey. The Beachwood Sparks. Um, all right. Well, the thing about Scott Pilgrim, the other thing is that you, we had to make up fake bands, which is complicated, which is um, some movies do a bad job uh, or, or just a not so great job. There's some movies I feel like I, I'll watch them and the band within the movie just doesn't sound like a real band or just sounds flat. Um, but I would say, and you guys might agree, the movie Scott Pilgrim vs. the World did an incredible job with original music. Yeah. And, and fake
fake bands. So uh, before I even go back to you, Edgar, I wonder what did the bands, what did Sex Bob Bomb sound like in people's heads before they saw the movie? Because I think most of these guys read the books before the movie. Ben David? I didn't think of them that cool because I didn't have the imagination for it. Luckily, I eventually got to build upon what it was already done. But I remember very, very vividly the first time sitting down and watching that movie and when they started playing, I was not expecting it to like kick my fucking head off. Yeah. Like, I was like, all right, he's gonna be like this little indie rock thing. And I'm like, whoa. Uh, and then, you know, unfortunately we have to live up to that legacy forever. So thanks for that one. <laughs> Yeah. Um, do you guys have any input on that, or should we just jump to Edgar? I There's a phrase that I always thought about. There's a documentary about a band called Lightning Bolt, where there's a guy named John Dwyer, who's been in a million good bands, and when he's talking about Lightning Bolt, he's like, yeah, they're kind of fun, kind of sucky. Like, they, like I always thought Sex bob was, like, a very good, sucky band, if that makes sense. Like, not yeah. awesome at their instruments, but fuck are they good. Right. <laughs> And I think, I feel like that's kind of what we went for, isn't it? A little bit? Well, what happened, like to answer your question that, like about, we, we decided, myself and Nigel Godrich, who like um, did the score for the, the movie, <coughs> and um, <coughs> Woo indeed, and uh, <laughs> we basically decided that we thought we should have different bands playing different artists. Right, rather that's, than, that's the key, yeah. Yeah. And so, and you were party to some of this, is that we kind of went around the world or like meeting these bands. I, I guess it was, maybe it was after the writer's strike in 2007, 2008, but I remember during the summer, we went to Toronto. Always remember to drop the second T. Toronto, um, not Toronto. Um, and we, I was already aware of Metric even before like you had sort of told me about that. And then it kind of, I think I'd already heard like Photo of a Girl and like that song, but anyway. We, we went to meet like uh, Metric, we went to meet Broken Social Scene, and we were sort of like looking at bands that might be like Sex with Bomb. Like, but, and bands, some of the bands that en ended up on the soundtrack, like The Black Lips, or um, there was this other band that I was obsessed with called Be Your Own Pet, that yeah. um, we had a different story about that, but like we never, we never actually met them because they broke up. Aww. And um, they've now reformed though, they have an album out. I saw them in LA on Thursday night, 15 yeah. years after I was supposed to meet them for Scott Pilgrim. They're great, um, great band. And, They're and incredible. I, I mean, yeah. their new, new Yorkers, album is fantastic. And it was- yeah. The new album's called Mommy, I think. Isn't it's it? great. <laughs> and it was, I met the lead singer for the first time and she said, the biggest regret in her life is that she never had that Scott Pilgrim <laughs> meeting. <laughs> but we did use one of their songs in the trailer. Oh, but, that's right. But then what happened after that is that Nigel, we'd met some people, and after that didn't happen, Nigel Godridge just said, why don't we just ask Beck to do it? And I was like, do you think he would? And he said, I said, it's so in his wheelhouse of what he used to do when he was starting out, where it was a lot thrashier. And he basically, over a weekend, he did it in his garage. So he, it is garage rock, because it's literally in a garage. But we took your artwork and we blew it up and we put it all around the walls and we had a list of the scenes and what he, there weren't any song titles, just like this is the list of the scenes and this is what we'd like to do and this is the kind of thing. And I mean, he had, gave him the script pages, but I don't think he ever read the script pages, but he had all the artwork all over the walls. And then at the end of this weekend, I was again given like a CDR of like 24 songs yeah. that he'd done in like two days, just with him and a drummer. And some of the things that are in the film are, are, are like the, the, the opening song, We Are Sex Bob that goes over the only credits, is the only take of that song. Because Nigel oh. said, you know, he'd done, the, he'd done these demos and they were really raw and like the lightning bolt you were saying about. And Nigel said, I don't know why you would redo these. Yeah. He said, like, you should just get the actors to sing on top of it, but like, why would they be any better than this? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was crazy. I remember those demos so well. Um, but yeah, for me, like as I was like a '90s teen, and all of a sudden I'm sitting with Nigel Godrich, and he's like, "Why don't we just get back to do it?" I mean, it was so it was so like in the stratosphere that from happens what, what to I was me all used the time. To. Yeah, <laughs> so um, it was it was incredible. Um, I remember we met Beck on his tour bus. Uh, my only memory of Beck's tour bus was that I was chomping ginger candy because I was getting car sick from being on the tour bus when it was moving. <laughs> but Beck did the movie. Um, he is he is sex bob in so many ways, um, and we you know we have to pay our respects to him when we when we revisit sex bob -omb. 
in this new show. Um, Can I tell one story that I've tell, never told? Tell one before? story. Yeah, go ahead. I don't think I've ever. I think I've told you this before, but this is this is true. I mean, because and let me preface this with like. Beck's songs are obviously brilliant. And it's funny that we're talking about, are Beck's songs too good to be sex with one? <laughs> At the premiere of Scott Pilgrim in LA, Rivers Como from Weezer was there. And Woo! he came up to me and he said, oh, I really enjoyed your film. And he said, why, why didn't you ask me to do the songs? <laughs> and he goes, he goes, he goes, and he said something along the lines of, he said, I, I just think that the band should have been playing good songs. And I was like, ouch! <laughs> that, that actually uh, helps me feel a little bit better of a story I've been telling for a decade. Which is, and I was uh, like, Rivers, I think Beck did a good job. I think you're wrong. I didn't say that. Did I, I, was too, I was too amazed by what had just come out of his mouth. <laughs> did, I was, was, at, the, the, I was at the premiere. The he was thing. there, yeah. I was at the premiere. That, that's the night I met you. Uh, oh, that's right. Because my uncle is friends with Michael Sarah, and he was yeah. like, "You should come to this." And so, yeah, he's an actor. So he, he brought me out, and uh, I was standing in a circle. That I was, it was like it must have been like you with Nigel Godrich. I was like, "Oh my God!" I'm standing next to like Jason Schwartzman and like Beck's musical assistant, and there's Rivers Cuomo, and this is like some people who work on Tim and Eric. This is so cool. And I was talking to Beck's musical assistant about like working on the game soundtrack. I was like, yeah, like we did a lot of music, and then I turned to Rivers Cuomo. I was like, and by the way, like Weezer was super influential to all the music that we did in the game. And he looked at me, looked away. I think he found his wife and left the party. <laughs> uh, now, now I have a little more context. Uh, Okay. <laughs> Some closure. Well, yeah, yeah. that's amazing. I, I don't remember Rivers Cuomo being at, at the He beginning. wasn't there long. <laughs> what if we just spend the whole panel talking about Rivers Cuomo? <laughs> we'll conjure him if we say his name too many times. Um, yes. All right, let, let's move on to uh, the video game then, since we mentioned it. Rivers, 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 no. I listened to Perfect Situation on the way here. Yeah. Did you hear <laughs> Uh, anyway, well, so I mean, while Edgar was working on the movie, I, I mean, I was drawing a comic, but at the same time, um, Edgar's brother Oscar and I went to Montreal to work on a video game of the movie of the books. Um, and right away, they asked about music, and I said Anamanaguchi. And I mean, I had already been sharing their early EPs and stuff with Edgar. I remember. Um, I had no idea they were like in high school or something. How, how old were you guys? Uh. Around that time, I was like, when, when you got the maybe like when you got the ask. When we got the uh, 20? 20. Yeah. Early college. Twenty one yeah. for me. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Who's older than twenty here? Hands up. Oh, that's pretty <laughs> good. You guys are old. <laughs> twenty. 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 <laughs> 20. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, so, yeah so I mean, so what was it like when you uh, when you four lads were asked to do the score? Dude, twenty year olds. That, that 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 could be a whole hour, but I, I will sum it up by saying it was it, hectic. It, it it was hectic. Yes, and it it started as a situation where. Uh, a man asked us to cover Aerosmith Love in an Elevator because there was a level set in an elevator. And uh, we were like, okay, we could maybe do that, I guess. And then, and then uh, the whole game got canceled and then nobody was working on it anymore. And then we just got to kind of do whatever we wanted and then it, uh, it was awesome. As long as you did it really fast. Yeah, and we did do it really, really fast. Yeah, and we did school very bad during that time. I dropped out of school. I, yeah, yeah, I, got, I got the short end of the stick there. Yeah. Y'all have just been my, like me and not done college, honestly. Yeah, let's go. Me too. Um, but no, we were so I ruined your lives, is what you're saying. Exactly. <laughs> In a good way. Okay. But we, we would stay up till like 7 a.m. James was working at a, a mastering studio at the time, like the, the best place in the world, Sterling Sound in New York City. Whoa. And uh, we would be there after hours until 7 a.m. every night, like just working on, on just, the songs just with our mixing bouncing up and down on a Nintendo. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out Chris, Nate, uh, Chris Athens, let us use the studio. Yes, he did. Chris yeah. Athens. And, uh, uh, Shout out to Nate and Gabe who helped mix that at like 7 a.m. while we were shouting at them under the gun and it, you, yeah. You know what? That soundtrack fucking rocks. Yeah! Thank you. Yeah! I agree. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, what I what what video game music turned you into a video game music maker? Like for me, Mega Man. Bro, bro I was about to say yeah! Mega Man Two. Yeah! Mega, Man 2. Yeah! Mega Man Two was the greatest music of all time when I was a child. Yeah. There was a moment in my life where I was sitting in my basement covering Weezer songs with my buddies George <laughs> and Adam and stuff, and uh, we took a break to play Mega Man and eat plain Entenmann's donuts, and uh, we were playing the Bubble Man stage. Oh my god! And we were just like. 
this sounds like sunny day real estate. Like uh, we, we had that epiphany and then we used my little Korg mixer and we covered Bubble Man. And we were like, yeah, this rocks. And we were in like a weird like indie band. And then I started making like Egyptian music like yeah. almost immediately after. And uh, yeah, three years later that EP came out that you heard, yeah. Damn. So donuts, it, there's a chemical formula. There is a here. chemical formula. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's, let's um, how are we doing for time? And do we, what time is it? Anyone? 721. Oh, that's not We should bad. probably start talking about a show soon. That's yeah, that's what I was, that was my next sentence. We're going to jump into the show now, uh, a.k.a. Scott Pilgrim takes off. As you can see behind me, um, it's coming out November 17th. Uh, so anyway, this this is just a repeat of what I said, but, I, I, you know, I right away, I was like, let's get on Monoguchi. Um, you know, I just feel like they're they're known for chip tune, but they're so versatile. They can do anything. Plus, they're out of high school now. Um, <laughs> and then um, my co-conspirator here, Ben David, had been working with Joe. So maybe I'll throw it to Ben David. Like, how did that start to come together? What was your thought process? I remember you felt guilty about making the band drop out of college. <laughs> and because of that, and we just didn't want to end up in another Weezer situation. So... <laughs> Uh, you, you initially were talking about how you're going to do the songs with them, and when we were talking about score, which is the thing I get like super obsessive about, my first instinct is always I got to work with this guy because he's the I, nicest man I've ever met in my fucking life. But I always work with this guy because he's my friend and he's brilliant. Um, but we had a huge like workload, as everyone knows now, who worked on it. Is there's a gigantic amount of fucking score that we had to write, which hopefully I think a, you might have heard a bunch of while you're sitting here in the in cold. Every style, man. Yeah, every, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I was like, you know, Joe could do a really good job on his own, but that's not good enough. And the band's brilliant, but I don't know if if they had 40 people in that band, maybe we could do enough to do it. But I think that if the math is, if you had Joe and them, we could have figure out how to get enough music. And because Joe would work with like. Daft Punk and all these like people like is it M83 or M83? I can never get M83. Mike Shinoda, all these people. You you do all kinds of stuff on your own, but you've also collaborated with bands before. And I'm like, and they already do great stuff on their own. I just felt like it would be the best Voltron possible. <laughs> um, and then we just ended up in this insane like bullet train of just trying to write all kinds of music where everyone would be working on different cues while you would be working on a song that I didn't even know existed. And everyone was just constantly trading wave files with each other with harebrained ideas uh, until we were, you know, more than happy because I think the music is awesome. But it was an insane process, but it only could have gotten done if we had hired the right people who were sitting behind me and next to me. They're awesome. Thank you. Wow. I'll take I also, it. We didn't feel guilty about making a drop out of college. That was just a joke. <laughs> <laughs> no guilt. Damn. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, we also had to make songs, as he mentioned. Um, how did it feel to step into those Sex bob shoes? It was the it was back really shoes. Cool. I mean, intimidating, first of all, because like Sex bob has been, it, it's like in the first pages of the comic, it's like, this is where we're starting from. Like, who's, who's Scott Pilgrim? He's a guy in a band. What's the band? Sex bob -omb. Okay, cool. <laughs> so we, uh, I mean, when we first read the comic, um, like it was right after we had been asked to work on the game like we weren't even sure about what it was but we were touring uh, when that happened so luke and i and ari like all of us we really became a really obsessed with the comic we loved it like from off rip you know and uh but when we were working on the show luke uh was staying with me in dallas <clears throat> in the studio and stuff and we were like we love the like the garage thrash of Back, right but like uh, some were saying it's like you use your imagination when you read the book so it's gonna sound different to everybody yeah and um, I remember like I really asked like Luke for guidance of like what would this sound like <laughs> to you but you actually had the chords in the in the book and like oh right yeah and so I the first pass I did I was like what if they just use those exact chords? Yeah, what if we do that song? Right. Yeah, in the book, if you guys yeah. don't remember, there's a section where I have like the chords of the song that Sex Bob is playing. It's like page five of book one or something. Yeah, so I remember doing a demo of that and like had a kind of like promise ring vibe to it and like that was cool. But we, when Luke came over, we, we kind of like, we took it in a couple different directions and uh, I, I really liked, you know, Scott plays like a Rickenbacker bass and like maybe he's not so good at yeah. it, but 
it's like there's got to be some like Beatles energy in here. They're like, you know, a pop band, right? Did, did someone end up buying you a Rickenbacker? Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, that guy. Someone did. In fact, the, there is a Rickenbacker all throughout the score, and that dude is is actually sitting right there, and he's got some cool <laughs> Pete, hair. Pete, Pete texted me. He's like, I found a Rickenbacker. I don't have enough money for it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You're those, really, those are expensive. You're bases, really bad dude. host. You didn't do research on this and find out you bought it. I didn't find out <laughs> I bought it. Yeah. You had to. You didn't know that. Right. Um, yeah. No. We, Pete, Pete has. I haven't even seen it, but I own it. You do own it, and you will uh, see it on Friday when we perform live. In oh, hell yeah. yeah. But, but I have to say, Brian, once we had the Rick in hand and we put some nice tape-wound strings on it, the song has just kind of happened, like, actually. Yeah, it definitely, yeah. The, the bass kind of plays itself. Yep. Yeah, um, it's the tool for the job. Another so, thing I wanted to ask is in, in, do you have something else? I forgot to say something earlier when I was talking about the, two, the band working together with Joe, which was that from the very first genesis of this process when Brian and I decided to work together and like be co-showrunners and do everything together uh, we thought like the end result of that would be something that neither of us would ever do on our own which would make it have like a really unique sensibility and then our hope was that once Abel interpreted it would become something even cooler than less that we expected and the whole show to us was like mixing together a bunch of people who are like really talented and specific and we kind of were hoping the end result of it would be something that none of us would have done on our own so I just feel like this is a score that could only exist because these group of people did it and the show can only be the weird, insane thing it is because we did all this and it got filtered through Abel and all the geniuses of Saru. So that was our process the whole time is we just kind of kept feeling like the more cool people we put onto it, the more idiosyncratic the overall thing would be. Speaking to that well, point, that the, the Sex Bob Bomb songs were, were co also co-written by somebody who's kind of cool. Uh, <laughs> well, that, that I, I helped you. you guys. I, I gave you some guidance. You did? Um, Luke wrote a lot of the lyrics. That's right. And uh, the bass played itself. Brian um, sang all the vocals on our demo, so it was animated to Brian's voice. For, that's not a joke. He's, there, there's, no, so there's no singer in Anamanaguchi, so I was just like, ah, shit, we got to make vocals. He even did Kim, and I didn't know it was Kim until he told me later. I'm like, yeah, but who did the Kim part? And he's like, oh, no, that was me. So our, you know, was our, just, all our animation. Going, One, two, three, four. <laughs> well, yeah, our animation for a long time was all to Brian singing, and then the actors came in and replaced him. So I had about six months of watching animation passes, and I was always hearing Brian singing. <laughs> and I Brian's takes were so good that like it took a while to be like, nah, but you gotta nail the magic of the demo. Like, I, thought they were, yeah. I thought they were great. <laughs> Would you sing for us now? But, <laughs> <laughs> I don't even remember the songs right now. You can sing Love and Elevator, it's cool. Yeah. Um, the, other, should, the other thing I wanted to ask somewhere. about on the show, on the songs was um, in animation, um, when someone plays guitar, someone has to be drawing that person playing guitar. Oh yeah. Do you guys remember uh, what you did to, to get that footage? <laughs> I, I do. J yeah. James and Ari, why don't you field this one? When I got this video, I laughed so fucking hard. So, <laughs> and this anecdote will deliver. So, yeah, Ari, you, you seem shy, but I could tell the story if you like. <laughs> The context, though, was our brilliant animation said, can you please send us very detailed videos of all the instruments being played and close-ups of the hand doing it for each of the parts? And then what did you guys do? So we kind of we kind of snuck into a guitar center with our iPhones, like kind of <laughs> hidden. Nice. We set Luke up behind a, a drum kit. We were like, yeah, we need to buy a drum set for a show. Do you mind if we, like, just play this drum for a little while? And they said, <laughs> yeah. They did say yes, yeah. but me, James, and Ari all posted up to, to get yeah, proper like three, coverage. Yeah, like three <laughs> angles of like kick drum, front ahead, side, and then I just played through the songs once or twice, and we're, and we're like, no purchase today, thank you very much. <laughs> so they sent us video without any warning, and suddenly I'm like, are all of these con like high-res videos for animation reference, you guys in a guitar center <laughs> using instruments you don't own? And they're Everything like, with price tags on it? Yeah. That's a process. Drum sets are expensive, man. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was amazing. Um, all right, I mean, I don't know. We're going pretty fast here, but... Um, Joe was, hasn't said Joe anything. Joe hasn't said anything. <laughs> Joe, Joe, how can you be a genius and say nothing? Yeah. Well, that's a sign like genius. I, I, I was about to say, I think that's the secret right there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> just, just shut up. That's why I've never moderated a panel before. People used to think I was smart. Uh, <laughs> um, well, um, I was, I don't know. what. How can we talk about this anime? How can we describe this anime without spoiling it? Is, ben Dave is pretty good at this point. I could, I, you know what? Well, yeah, take with, this you, give me a, give me a take, Joe. No pressure. No pressure. Joe, I'll, I'll, Joe, I'll, Joe. I'll, I'll tell you what it means to me. And I, Pete, Pete said a great word that I just keep coming back to is imagination. The idea of 
I, you know, in, in one of the uh, press things I've done, someone said, you know, why do you, you know, why, why Scott Pilgrim? It's like, because anything can happen, Scott Pilgrim. And I think uh, even, even if you're just a fan of the film, you could tell it's this really incredible world that you've built, that you've built, that where you do feel like it's your imagination running wild. And so that's what the show is. It's so exciting to me. It's like, let's reiterate or let's iterate on that idea of like, let's reimagine these characters and put them in a scenario that might be a little bit more unexpected and might take them to some places we, none of us could expect even <laughs> most of us on the stage here right. probably. Well, that's the thing that was so fun about it to me is the range of music in this season is so insane. I mean, we have one episode, the Lucas Lee episode, I decided the only needle drops could be from soundtracks of Tony Hawk Pro Skater games. Because look, he is a pro skater. And if we're gonna pick songs, we need to create rules. Like if anything can happen in this universe, we actually have to create some rules. So the idea was we could only have songs if they were in a Tony Hawk game in that episode. And then there was one I got really excited about and I texted to Brian. Most of the creative process was Brian and I for three years texting each other stuff. Nine times out of 10, Brian goes, yes. And sometimes all caps, absolutely not. <laughs> and I won't say, but a very popular song from the first Tony Hawk game, I was gonna have a big set piece set to it. And I was so amped. And I, uh, I sent it to him and he just goes, absolutely not. And then I it was like, okay, well, what about Police Truck by Dead Kennedys? And he goes, yeah. <laughs> Uh, spoiler, that song's in the show. I, I, don't, I don't remember which one I rejected. Well, I'm not going to be mean yeah, to Primus. Don't, don't. Um, <laughs> oh, I see. That's why I rejected well, and just it. Just to give you an idea of the range, I mean, th then, you know, I feel like after that text message, you then texted me and said, Joe, can we come over to your house and sit around your piano and just hang out for a little while? And then you came over and we just sat around my piano and just... And spoil our Ishtar sessions. No, uh, no, exactly. <laughs> but, but, but why that... Ha but yes, Brian and, and I and him did spend an entire day uh, where I was singing lyrics to him and then he would turn them into real music and there's a reason that's in the show that we will not say. There's a, there's a lot of crazy stories we'll have to tell you guys later. But I would tell you the, the process show. of doing the score, the best one was... So there's an extended fight scene in, in episode two that is maybe like eight minutes long and it keeps shifting in music styles where... Like, Ari has a section that's is like this unbelievably cool video game kind of techno thing, but then it transitions to a, a section where I, my only pitch was a uh, 90s uh, NBA Nike commercial with like a hit and pop vibe. <laughs> then it becomes like a straight up raid style thing. And then it builds into something where I pulled over my car one day and recorded a voice memo for Joe. And I was like, you know how like in Matrix 3 when they have the people chanting in Latin or in Duel of Fates, they're doing that? Well, what if they're like chanting like evil exes? And, and, I, and I was like singing it and like doing this whole thing, which is because I'm stupid as hell. And then I sent it and then I kept driving. He texted me back and he's like, yeah, we'll do that. And within days, Brian and I were in front of a choir in Burbank. And we're like, oh no, and they were that's literally not serious. singing Evil were, Exes yeah. exactly how he had sung Yeah, and I was like watching all this happen. I was like, how is this my life? How is this? <laughs> and this is all just for one action scene in one episode. So that's like how stupid our score is. Like, we spent all this time on just one scene and then we never repeated ourselves. You know, uh, when, when so Edgar made it. a movie of my book, I felt like a make a wish kid. Do you know what that is? <laughs> Um, but I did, but I didn't die at the end. Um, and then, and now, I mean, I, I felt like that again. I just, I don't know. I feel, it feels so magical. Um, we, we got to do so much fun stuff every day on this show. Uh, I kept switching between two analogies is that I felt like Brian and I were Make-A-Wish kids or we were robbing a bank and no one was arresting us and they were never going to arrest us. So, <laughs> but both, both, both robbing both a bank sounds same stressful. I guess making a show is a little bit stressful. Okay. It's, I, it's, I like, it's like Reservoir Dogs without the cops. Without the cops. <laughs> without <laughs> the gunshot wounds. Fun. But wow. like non-cops, people got shot by non-cops too. No one got shot on this. Everyone got oh, shot. that's true. There was no, no one pain. Got shot. Great. Um, all right. Well, I mean, I, I feel like we're close to wrapping up. But do we still have time for... Um, Questions or do, Maybe do I we have any other anecdotes? Or yeah, I would be I would be kind of remiss. I just need to put it out there very publicly. Like, it was so fucking crazy to be working with Science Taru. Yeah, yes. and like it feels worth it for me to put out there that like the way that they work on on television and the way that music plays into their work specifically, like. I don't know if anyone here has seen that show, Keep Your Hands Off Azo Ken. 
But yeah. uh, what that tries to put across about the power of animation and like creating something, like very important. So the yeah. power of music within Scott Pilgrim and specifically by this team is like that's the most exciting part of it for me. Like that it, yeah. it has to be cohesive and it has to be part of this world that they are making discreetly. They've never made the same show twice. They're the same show fucking once. Yeah. So like <laughs> it it feels important to note that like I mean to Ben David's point, it's such a part of this package also, that, that they brought us in. I, I want to say a, a little intro style that before uh, before we wrap, if, if we're wrapping right now, I mean, uh, like, being able to have the band be reined in not only by, like, you guys and your writing and direction, but, like, working with Joe, man, we got to do so much exciting stuff that we've never been able to do before, and, like, having... I feel like everything we didn't learn in school, we did learn literally in this <laughs> literally. Class, which is great. Yeah, jo Joe is like a college professor. Is what you're saying. Joe is like the dean of of music, right? I mean, so it's a pro to not yeah. dropping out. That is why yeah, yeah. we wanted to pair you guys. I, I, up. I didn't drop sense. out. I dropped up. Uh, but the show he's mentioning is a, about kids in school who are making an anime, and because Brian and I had never made an anime while we were having our writers room at his house, which is just the two of us, like sitting on a couch watching anime all day and then making each other laugh. We were literally watching their show about making an anime while we were writing it as a way to like inspire us and try to pretend we knew what we were doing. Uh, and I just have to say, because it hasn't been brought up enough, is Abel, our director, is unbelievably brilliant. And everyone there is... Oh, there he is! He's here! Oh, everybody. Uh, it, if he wasn't a genius, our show would suck. And I think our show is awesome because he's awesome. So thanks, man. He's, he's the best. And if you guys speak Spanish, speak Spanish to him. He doesn't get to speak Spanish enough. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, I was uh, I was gonna say yeah, any closing words too? Well well just I'm just gonna just gonna drive that home. I mean working on uh, working on animation as a composer, as a musician is always so much fun for many reasons. One of the reasons is you do get to see the sausage made, you're working the animatics, you're in very early meetings. And so uh, we were just blown away, you know, when we got the final animation, seeing what these guys were putting together. It's just such a treat to see that all come to life. Yeah, we would finish the score to animation that was like a kind of a rough lock animatic. And then months later, suddenly you would see this awesome score and awesome performances then married to like unbelievable animation. And you were already like, it was so fun to watch. But then it was like you're just getting, it was like Christmas every time, where suddenly, like, Brian and I would get a text at like 1 a.m. saying, Oh, the final animation for 106 is here. And you're like, Holy shit. And you like run to your TV. And then it was just a bunch of us, we like text each other for hours about, Oh my God, it looks so great. It's all, it always looked better than we would have hoped. Yeah, it was crazy how fast it felt like it came together because we spent a long time looking at very rough animation and then all of a sudden it's final and it's beautiful. Um, so I mean, it was kudos not fast to science, for Abel. Abel saw ten billion no, things uh, between yeah, that. Abel was in hell the whole to. time. So, uh, but yeah, for I'm us, sure it, it, was. it felt amazing. For Abel, maybe it felt very difficult. <laughs> I like to say the same thing because exactly what you said is how I felt watching the links to the episodes. Was like it felt like Christmas presents because it's like, and also it's like it's nice to have like a like a nice work email. <laughs> it's like like. You know, you get an email and it's like, all the other ones are like, oh, for fuck's sake. And it's like, oh, and I just get to watch 25 minutes of great animation, like, on a weekly basis. Or more, sometimes twice a week, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it got hectic for a while there. We, we were working on multiple episodes at the same time, trying to remember which episode I was writing or editing. It, it's complicated. Making that, a show is very Mal. complicated. I just want to thank our assistant, Mal, yeah, for keeping absolutely. track of that stuff. Oh, yes. Thank you, Mal. She's here. All right, I mean, I, I don't know. Um, I feel like we're wrapping up. What's, what's the time? Anyone? 7.40. We're, we're pretty good? 40 You want me to vamp? <laughs> what if we take two really bad audience questions? Oh, yeah, who, who's the, got the worse, the better. Yeah. Who's got really, the don't be, don't don't be bad up. intentionally, please. Who's, wait, wait who's, who's doing this? I can't. I don't want to go down there. You, you're the motor. You I think whoever's the furthest person back raising their hand should be able to resolve oh. a question, probably. There's somebody with a heart at the back on the end of a sword. There. All right, Josie's going to pick. All right, Josie, just hand it to someone who has their hand up, and, 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 and we'll, we'll let the debacle happen. Oh, you mentioned this season. Is there more seasons? 
Uh, oh. When I say this season, I just mean we made a season of television, and I mean the one that we made. Uh, and I would say that this season has an ending that we're very proud of, and we told a contained story where all everything emotionally and thematically we set up has closure, and we really love it. And at the moment, the idea of ever making anything again seems impossible, so maybe ask me again in January. But for now, I think we made something that's really cool, and if they stop making TV on November 18th, I'd be okay. Hi. Okay, Hi. Um, thank you so much, everyone on stage, for doing what you do. I am so hyped, this has been a dream to see this full anim animation since high school like I saw the adult swim like short that was made and I was just like I want more so thank you for pushing this through I'm so excited to see this so what my question is so what is it like working on a show compared to a film were you guys able to modify the story or change anything that you wanted to kind of like what the uh, invincible creator uh, was doing with uh, with his show I haven't well, seen Invincible. What did but, uh, do? I haven't seen Invincible, so I don't know what to say about that. All I know is that uh, we never changed anything because we never made mistakes, and we're, <laughs> and we're just so good. Yeah, at you this. guys are perfect. I remember that from the yeah. It's like oh, these guys are perfect, and everything's fine. And I, I mean, I think maybe he was asking like changes from the books. Yeah, we uh, we were. This is a new story. Um, this is not. I the mean, books, it, yeah, it's, it's, not a, the movie. it's a retail. It's an adaptation, technically. But uh, it's an can, incredibly uh, new way to approach the traditional is a very loose story word. of Scott. Um, yeah, I threw the books in the trash on day one, <laughs> essentially. But um, but we, I mean, it, there's so much of the DNA of it in there. So I just I really can't explain how it's different, but you'll find out, and it's fun. I think what's also fun is, you know, you see that film, and e each character you want to. <laughs> another film about them at yeah. least that's what I want you want to go home with them and see how they live and yeah it's just it's um, so and, yeah. and I feel like yeah TV is a medium where you just have a lot more time to do things and I also want to say uh, how incredible it is that the cast is just there right yeah. this fucking yeah. cast yeah uh I remember, because we were getting these animatics, right? And uh, we'd see early drafts, and it's like, okay, yeah, this is really funny, the acting's there. And then you hear Kieran Culkin as Wallace Walls, and it's like, yeah. oh yeah, yeah, this is exactly how it needs to be. And I can't believe I've never I, seen I, this before. I was tasked with writing the greatest email of all time to get them back. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's give a big shout out to email. But I say, email because it, if it hadn't it had to work and since it worked it technically is the most important email ever written I, I won't I won't really have but one part of it I remember is I was I was basically like sort of you know blowing smoke up their ass and sort of being really nice but I did say the, I just called them the greatest cast of all time and I put an asterisk and there was the rest of the email and then the woman said yes even better than the godfather <laughs> but I do want to say even though I've said it a bunch in press because I'm sure you guys have read all of our interviews um, is that when he sent the email out, he sent it out in the morning, and I went over to Brian's, I was sitting on his couch, we're like, ordering a salad, like, talking about things, and I'm thinking, well, one, they're never gonna do it, but if they decide they're gonna do it, it's gonna take, like, three or four months of, like, hemming and hawing or whatever, and then, bing, it's like, oh, someone said yes. I'm like, okay, whatever. And then within, like, two hours, almost the entire cast had said yes, and I felt like I was losing my grip on reality, because it's like... I'm trying to come up with a story here. Why is Chris Evans bothering us by saying yes to our show immediately? <laughs> no, it was the weirdest thing. We had, when it got greenlit, we got greenlit without the cast. I didn't think we were going to get him. And then Edgar apparently wrote the best email of all time. And then they all said yes. And the way I just felt about it, it's like we were going to bake a cake, but we didn't know if our ingredients were going to suck shit. And then we had the best ingredients in the entire world, so I felt a lot better about the show. You're I, good at metaphor. Wow, you should be a writer. <laughs> I know. I know. I remember it's funny. I I uh, like I uh, did um, comedy bang bang the other day, and I told this story. And Scott Ackerman immediately said, "Who who replied last?" <laughs> ooh, <laughs> like, then, I said, "Spicy." Well, I said, "Well, Mark Webb is in Australia a lot of the time, so I don't think you can really like blame." Yeah, I, mean, well, I don't know if it was definitely him. I do remember that Michael Sarah's response. He goes, "Take that, the Expendables." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, has there been an Expendables anime yet? I'm not sure. I'm There's going to sure. be one any day now. Yeah, probably. I was just going to answer your question. Another thing about Brian that's amazing is that when we were like writing the script, me and Michael Bacall, we came to Toronto to pick your brains because I think by the time we were starting to do the movie, 
three books were out and you were well into drawing the fourth. Something and, like that. And then you had what I can only describe as for five and six was like, if not a plot, but like a brainstorm of like ideas, some sort of plot ideas. And then also like a lot of ideas that also didn't end up in the books at all. Mm. A couple of which are in the movie. So it was like, it was just like amazing seeing. I feel like you had then later said that you you felt like you had to write something because we were coming to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, even earlier on than that, when you first, um, when you guys first started asking about doing the books as a movie, it was just like, how does it end? And I was like, I, I don't know. <laughs> it was, I had just done the first book. You know, he, he caught on to them so early. So, um, yeah, I just had to kind of vamp and make stuff up as I went along. I knew there would be a girl, so there would be, you know, a, an ex-girlfriend. There would be twins. I knew there would be six books. That was about it. So I filled in the blanks, um, and and you guys went for it. There was one scene that was in your in your um, ideas, and we it was originally we did, there's storyboards for this, and it was the one bit even on that film where the producers were like, "Can we can we not do that?" And it was in it was the Mecha Gideon, like Gideon right, turned right, into right. a massive like Mecha Gideon. Well, that goes point. back to Mega Man. Yeah, I was trying to do a Mega Man thing where it would be like a robot, but then the tiny Gideon behind the robot. Oh yeah, yeah. The, the well, why didn't Mega anyone Man show that? me this before we did the show? We could have had a Mecha Gideon. That's perfect. We had the oh, boards. I that. It's like yeah, the one boards. thing that there's, there was storyboards for it and everything, and then I think it's. I think point, it's on the DVD. Oh okay, maybe it yeah. is. Ben David, it sounds like you might need another season to. Uh, <laughs> says ask about season two again I'm throwing if, a if microphone you all, if you guys all pray really hard well, um, anyway um, yeah I, I um, what was I what else was I going to say oh the um, the poster from the movie this is the TIBB and all the exclamation that poster has so many exclamation words what's the joke that she says uh, does that poster have enough it's at least more exclamation marks I believe that was from a script from the books that I didn't use and you guys used it I believe I there's must, one line from our screenplay that you put into the books because you liked it I believe it was you have a, you had a sexy phase <laughs> <laughs> I think that was you and Mike yeah um, alright it looks like we are getting the signal to wrap it up thank you guys so much um this is Thank incredible. You. I guess we're going to um, take a little break and sign. Um, and you guys know about the, the Netflix envelopes, right? They're, I don't know yeah. what happened with them, but apparently there's prizes in some of them. Is that right? I would definitely go to a vending machine if there's anything still in there and get what's in the vending machine if you like getting good stuff. There might be stuff in there that you I might want to I see people mixing it. Yeah, no, the no, vending is machine it? is good to go. We're done. We're dead. People, Did, people have already won. Never mind, they got it all. Great job, everybody. Cool. Congratulations on winning. So so we brought that up awkwardly. Ow. All right, cool. We're gonna do a signing. I think in a bit. we should say that Brian Lee O'Malley is a great moderator. Space Ghost. Space Ghost. Space Ghost. Space Ghost. Space Ghost. Space Ghost. Man, I've never seen Space Ghost. What? This is, my entire, this is my entire collaboration with Brian, is we'll work on stuff, and then ten times a day, I've never even seen that. <laughs> so, it's great. That's me. All right, guys, thank you so much. We're going to sign in a little bit um, and mingle, hopefully, later on. So, uh, hang out.